Hi there everyone, welcome to our latest Zoom talk. Uh, I can see uh, lots of people dropping in on the call now, so I will just give people a little bit of time to, uh, to join the call. Um, thank you very much to all of you for, for joining. Um, we're excited to have uh, so many people um, join up for this call uh, and I can see some familiar names there. Hello, hello Kit. Um, lovely to see you. Um, see uh, Mike Ludlow there as well. Hello, lots of uh, Nikki. Hello, lots of familiar names and Pat. Um, so thank you for all of you for uh, uh, joining us again this evening. Um, and for those of you that um, have not joined one of our calls before, um, then um, we hope you we, we hope you enjoy it. Um, so this evening. Um, we are talking about St Helena. Um, my name's Phil from Dive Worldwide and I'm joined this evening um, by our Anthony Thomas um, out in St Helena. Um, hi there, Anthony. Hi all. Hi there, how are you doing today? Uh, great, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great day here in St Helena. Well, we can chat about a little bit more about that later, yeah, later on. Perfect, perfect. And how have, how's your, your diving and whale shark sightings been this week? You've had any, had any luck? Whale shark sightings have been very, very successful this week. We only had a great encounter yesterday uh, with uh, uh, two whale sharks uh, at uh, a hot spot, really. Um, but yeah, it's been great, great all week. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, and we're also very lucky to have with us today uh, Danny Copeland, um, who's a, um, a wildlife cameraman and multimedia um, expert. Um, hi there, Danny. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Phil. How's the? How are you guys? Very hello good. to everyone else as well. I can't obviously see you, but hi. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're all there in the, in, all there. In, in the background. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, we're here to talk about um, St Helena this evening to give you um, a flavour of this, this wonderful island. Um, Danny is leading a, a trip there for us um, next year, next February. Time to coincide with the whale sharks that gather in, in this area. Um, Danny is uh, something of an expert on um, sort of um, pelagic species and uh, whale sharks and manta rays particularly. Um, and we were very lucky to have him lead a trip for us in, uh, in 2019, uh, just, before, just before the world shut down, which was, which was very successful. Um, so we're planning on repeating that trip um, next year. So we'll tell you a little bit about that um, as part of this, this evening. Um, just to talk you through um, the general, uh, general uh, schedule, I suppose. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the island, then we'll hand over to Anthony, who's going to tell you about the diving, and also Danny, who will um, talk to you about the whale sharks. Um, there is um, a question and answer session on, uh, or section on here, so do feel free to ask any questions that you want to ask, um, and we will um, answer those um, at the end of the call. We'll answer as many as we, as we can, um, so that um, you uh, get all the information that you that you want out of out of this call. Okay, um, so without further ado, um, I will share my screen if I can get the technology right on that bit. Okay, so hopefully people can see my screen now. Yep, looking good. Alrighty, um, and I will just give you a quick introduction to. Uh, to St Helena, just to give you a little bit of picture of, uh, of, of the island and, and where we are. Um, so this is St Helena, um, beautiful, beautiful, tiny island, um, the most remote inhabited island in the world and one of the re most remote um, islands in the world. Um, so here we have um, a little map. Um, just to give you an indication um so you've got south africa here as you can see um st helena is this tiny little dot um out in the middle of the atlantic um it is um 1950 miles uh, kilometers sorry west of uh of africa um and 2900 kilometers east of south america so it really is right out there in a very very remote spot um its nearest neighbor is the ascension islands which is 700 um, miles or just over 1,100 kilometers to the to the north. So um, it's a very, very remote spot, um, only about 44, 47 square miles. So very, very small island, um, but full of beautiful vistas. Obviously, you can see the ocean from everywhere and wonderful biodiversity as well. Um, until 2017, um, you could only get to the island by ship. 
um, which sailed there, I think, you know, every every few weeks. Um, and that was the only way to get to St. Helena. Since 2017, um, it has an airport now. So you can fly in and that enables us to um, um, to um, run trips there um, and allow other people apart from the St. Helenians to enjoy their enjoy their beautiful island. Um, you can get there generally we'll be going in via via Johannesburg um, that's the usual route um, so down to South Africa and then an onward flight out to St Helena. Um, in terms of the climate um, so St Helena has got a subtropical climate um, they don't have four seasons like us um, so the weather's pretty consistent throughout the year they don't have drastic seasons um, it's actually relatively close to the equator um, but because of the trade winds, the cooling trade winds that come through, it's sort of a very mild 15 to 28 degrees all year. Um, so really lovely temperature. December to June is when you've got the sunniest times to visit. Um, and within that February and March um, tend to be the sunniest, sunniest months. Um, that's very unusual because that's when the whale sharks are there. In most places I know when you have the big marine life, it tends to coincide with a uh, with the worst weather or the, or the choppiest conditions so it's nice that they choose to come at the uh, the sunniest time of year um you have sort of the cloudiest weather is between august and november um and the winds slightly stronger there there, there as well um so um uh, that's the time when you get humpback whales but it can be a little bit choppier on the on on the ocean there um so you know very nice climate all, all year round very very pleasant um in terms of a little bit about the the island itself and the and the history um so it was actually discovered by the portuguese uh, in 1502 um and then settled by the british um well over a century later in 1659 um and back then it was an important sort of staging post for the british empire as we were trying to expand and dominate the world um so it was a very strategically important um point um right up until um the advent of the suez canal and steamships and the the staging post wasn't wasn't needed um it's also the resting place of napoleon um it's one of the things it's it's quite famous for so he was sent in in exile there um in relative comfort as far as i can work out but <laughs> obviously well away from the rest of the world um what you're looking at now is the capital jamestown um so this is where most of the um or possibly all of the uh local um population live um and it's considered to be one of the finest examples of georgian architecture sort of unsport georgian architecture left left in the world so you know it's a very interesting place in itself um, the islanders um, are known as saints. So Antony's a, a saint. There's only um, just over 4,500 of them. Um, ironically, there's another two of them in the town that I live in. So um, some of them have, uh, <laughs> have come <laughs> over here, um, but a lot of them have stayed there. Um, and the island's got a, um, a real reputation for being welcoming, generous, so friendly. It's, it's the kind of place, I'm sure, Anthony, you will, you will um, agree with this, kind of place where people wander down the street and everybody says hello to everybody, you know, very close knit community, that kind of yeah. um, kind of laid back friendliness that we've lost, you know, in our in our modern, modern, busy world. Would you agree with that, Anthony? Absolutely. Yes, uh, you, you're absolutely correct. Uh, it's one of the places where um, we actually say that you can't really have a St. Helenian as a pilot because you can't run the windows down and you won't be able to shake to everybody uh, as you go past. <laughs> Pretty much <laughs> as you're driving, you need to put your hand up as part of the culture. Right there. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. So it's a place really to come and to reconnect with, with, with nature and to relax and sort of disconnect from, from your emails. Um, um, this, by the way, we're looking down. This is um, the view we're looking at now, as I believe, is Jacob's Ladder, um, which if you're if you're feeling you want to keep fit when you're there, um, then you can climb up all those steps from the town up this up this steep sided valley. Um, Anthony, I just wanted to note a little. I've got a few notes here on, on cuisine, um, and uh, my notes say that um, rather than the traditional Sunday roast, there you, um, you 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 do a curry and roast. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. We do. It's tradition to have a curry and roast uh, on a Sunday, yeah. And the curry is of of any. Uh, it could be a vegetarian. It could be a, a goat, lamb, obviously beef, 
But yeah, curry and a roast on the Sunday is always a tradition. It's always the tradition. And um, yeah, one of their other dishes is uh, famous dishes to try when you're out there is the plo, which is a, a one pot uh, curried rice dish um, and uh, rather delicious uh, coconut fingers, which I understand, uh, Danny, you, you rather enjoyed on your on your first trip there. Very much so. Got a bit yeah. of a, very guilty of having a sweet tooth and uh, <laughs> they, tick that, they tick that box massively. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then um, other things with cuisine, um, barbecues are charmingly called cook-ups, which I quite like. Um, and then probably the most famous um, is the St. Helena coffee, um, which um, is only exported in small amounts. So it's very expensive in other parts of the world. Um, but of course, when you're on St. Helena, um, you really you know, get to enjoy it um, as, as, as much as you like. Um, so. That's a little bit about the island itself. Um, I'll just mention the Mantis Hotel. So I mentioned there about the Georgian architecture. Um, so the Mantis Hotel is where we'll be staying on the trip that um, we're putting on with Anthony and Danny. Um, so this was built next door to the uh, to St. James's Church there. Um, the church was born, uh, was built in 1774, I think, and um, the hotel um, or the, the building um, a little while afterwards. Um, it was the barracks for the East India Company at the beginning. Um, and then since then, obviously it's been a few other things and now it's an absolutely beautiful hotel. Um, as part of turning it into a hotel, they did an archeological dig in the grounds around it. Um, and they found lots of sort of um, fascinating um, uh, archeological finds, um, including this um, this archway that you can see here, which has been put into the main reception. So it's full of charm, full of character. Um, it's a beautiful base for the for, for the trip that we're running. Um, the main reason for going there, of course, is not the hotel and not Jamestown, however charming it is. Um, it's obviously the the nature both above and below the waves. Um, so. St Helena is less than a third of the size of the Isle of Wight, um, but it's got 30% of the biodiversity, not only of the UK, but also of the whole of the British Overseas Territories. So there's a phenomenal amount going on, lots of endemic species, similar levels of endemics to the Galapagos. So it's sometimes called the Galapagos of the Atlantic. Um, it's a very, very special place indeed. Um, one of the other things it's famous for is Jonathan the tortoise, who we've got a fine shot of here, which hopefully you can see. Um, Jonathan is the oldest animal in the world, as far as anybody knows, um, and I believe he's celebrating his 190th birthday this year. Um, extraordinary. He's seen a, you know, see, seen a lot of changes in the world in that time, um, uh, and we hope he's still around next year um, to uh, so that you can see him as well on the trip. He's something of a celebrity um, there. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, the waters um, and the marine life is um, the reason that we as divers and, and marine life lovers want, want to go there. Um, so um, I'm going to leave Anthony and Danny to talk about this mostly. But just to give you an idea, um, you've got very high visibility there. Underwater, there's lots of endemic species as well. It's perfect for snorkeling and diving. Water temperature is always above 19 degrees and up to 26 degrees. Um, and there's reefs, there's caves, there's wrecks. Um, you get devil rays there, lots of other things. Dolphins, as you see in the picture that um, Anton is going to talk about. Um, and you get the whale sharks from December to March, which obviously is the reason that we are running a trip there in February next year. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavour just to kick us off um, of where we're talking about and a little bit about the, the island. Um, Anthony, if I could hand over to you now. Um, we occasionally lose Anthony to the blue of his 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 background, um, but he's he's, he's Sorry, definitely there. Yeah. Um, Anthony, <laughs> if we can um, turn over to you uh, to um, have a chat with us about the uh, about the diving. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Thomas. Uh, I'm the owner of Subtropic Adventures here in Saint Helena. Uh, the dive operation I've started in the year 2000, so I've been running this operation now for the past 22 years. I, I have 26 years of diving experience here on the island, uh, just over 8,000 dives. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's been astounding every year, really, how um, you visit the same site, but the abundance of life, how it changes, the opportunity of seeing different encounters. Uh, it's really thrilling to, uh, to be a part of. I just wanted to give you an idea of uh, what Phil said before in terms of your location. So that's the Mantis Hotel, as Phil rightly identified earlier. 
And just to put into perspective uh, how far the dive shop is from your accommodation, it's literally a 300 walk, walk, meter walk, sorry, to the dive shop. So just under five minutes at a casual stroll and you're at the dive shop. Um, in terms of embarking on the, the dive trips itself, we, we dive on a rib. It's an 8.5 meter rib. Uh, uh, so it's uh, equipped with the uh, accommodation of 16 divers, but a group of eight to 10, ten divers is, is very comfortable on there. And this is the landing area that we're, we embark on and disembark on. Unfortunately, we don't have any breakwater at this moment in time, but uh, we, we come alongside the famous Jamestown landing area uh, that has <laughs> been constructed for us by um, over the years by many, many different uh, engineers as the well develops in terms of engineering. But uh, it, it's, it's comfortable. It's very comfortable getting on and off, off the, uh, the vessel uh, as we, we come alongside. Just to give you an idea of the diving, because of our volcanic nature of, uh, of the island, we have a lot of caverns and archways, as well as um, swim throughs. And it, it actually hosts an abundance of life uh, underneath these archways and caverns. And with the light shining through, as you can see, the, the, it's, it's quite uh, remarkable really when, when you have an experience of, of the visibility as well as the diverse marine life that, that we have on offer. Uh, just to give you another idea of, of, of what it has. So we also have racks on the island. We have seven racks that is diveable. The uh, most popular one uh, is that of the SS Papua Nui, which basically is in James Bay itself in 12 meters of water. Uh, it caught fire and uh, ran aground on purpose to save everyone on board. And it, it just hosts again uh, at 12 meters, a remarkable location as an artificial reef of attracting uh, a diverse marine life. We at the moment have uh, the Dorado, the dolphin, or shall I say the Mahi Mahi uh, in the bay as well, chasing the needlefish. And mm. very often okay, we have the encounters of the Mahi Mahi chasing the needlefish as you dive on the Papua Nui wrap as one of the uh, sort of uh, pelagic species encounters just in 12 meters of water. Here is another wreck of called the Frontier Wreck, which was a drug ship, funny enough. It was a fishing vessel. Uh, this lies in 24 meters of water. Uh, but it, 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 again, it, it lies on the side and it has attracted uh, quite a bit of marine life. Funny enough, these are one of the, this is one of the sites where we have had encounters of whale sharks. So at 24 meters, uh, if it does go a little bit dull, uh, then you tend to want to look up just to see if anything has passed over or generally if it's, it's a cloud that came in front of the sun. And it, it has happened on several occasions where we have had a whale shark coming over the top of us. And then as you sort of move out away from the wreck to have a good look, it swoops down and then do a nice circle around and move off on its own, own path again. This is a flameback angelfish, which I've been told is uh, a very expensive fish on the aquarium market. Uh, it's a very rare on St. Helena, what was known to be rare on St. Helena, but um, again, as over the years, as I've dived many sites, they become more and more popular. You, you see them on uh, numerous occasions because now you're looking for them and they're a beautiful fish to, to engage with. They're very inquisitive once you allow them uh, the opportunity to come out from their sort of uh, hidden habitat, uh, they come towards you and then you, you're able to have remarkable shots of them. And as Phil mentioned earlier, we have the mobulus. So we have the Chilean devil ray uh, as one of the, the rays that we see on the, around the island. Um, it's, the best encounters is when you see them in singles or twos. They tend to circle you if you enter the water and uh, at the beginning of the dive, you have the ray at the particular dive site, then they tend to stay for the duration of the dive. You will have to leave them rather than they will leave you. However, we have had uh, numerous occasions where we have 15 or 21, 25s even, 
rays just swoop in, do one particular tan over the top of you, and then move off on their original path. But like I said, the best encounters is when you have the singles or the, or the twos. So the background picture that, um, that I did have of me is this one in particular. So these two rays stayed with me for the 65 minutes of this dive uh, at 14 meters. And as you can see, the visibility was great. We had 35 to 40 meters vis. And these two came in to the extent where if, you, if I wanted to, I could touch them. But obviously that's not part of the, uh, the engagement. There was a lot of photographs taken though, as particular memories. So just to swoop through some of the, the ray shots. Um, this time of the year as well, so January all the way through to uh, April, we have the migrating green turtle. So occasionally uh, we do have turtles mating, funny enough, on the surface and you, you have the opportunity of seeing them on sites. Um, due to the nature of the island, we don't really have sandy beaches where these turtles come to nest, other than a particular beach at the back of the island, uh, but it's not really, really sort of favorable for nesting. We have sand there, but it's really hard sand. So turtles would have a challenge digging that particular sand for a nesting site. But the encounters of green turtles are likely from January all the way through to April. And just to show you again, some of the uh, diverse marine life of squirrel fish, we have glass eye snappers, the butterfly fish, the endemics to the island, is around about 52 endemics to St. Helena, which includes the, the fish life, the nudibranchs, the mollusks, and also some of the, um, the life that grows among the, the rocks in terms of the seaweeds, as well as the um, corals. We don't really have hard coral, but we have soft coral and sponges um, underneath the caverns and generally in the hidden areas rather than being on, on the top of the, of the rock face. And just a shot of the St. Helena butterfly fish. This, this shot I put in there to remind me that every three to four years, there's an opportunity of seeing a mass spawning being conducted here on St. Helena. And so we haven't had it for two years now. So there's an opportunity of seeing it next year, obviously, or the year afterwards. But the mass spawning includes a large number, in other words, millions and millions of butterfly fish, uh, squirrel fish, along with the, what we call the Cavalli pilots or the damsel fish. And even though it's a sight to see, the photographers who were engaged with us a few years ago actually found it a, a bit sort of scattering. They were a little bit obscuring the, the pelagic species. So even though there was great to see so much life, it, it, it was a hindrance to, uh, to capturing the, um, the bigger picture of the, of the pelagic species. But it, it was an amazing sight. And the other fact that I wanted to point out is that I was always of, um, of the opinion that the devil rays were filter feeders in terms of plankton feeders until I experienced the rays feeding on the juvenile butterfly fish. And these rays were, were acting in pairs, or shall I say in couples, where they, one would swoop down to congregate them and the other one will go at high speed into the butterfly fish and gathering up as many as they could. And it was quite amazing to witness that. And uh, I was able to capture a little small video as well, which I, which I have in my collection. And just to point out, there's a diverse of nudibranchs that, that could be seen. Although they're not um, high in numbers, we, there's an opportunity of seeing them at particular dive sites, um, along with uh, other uh, sort of macro life that we find under the caverns in terms of shrimps, uh, the lobsters, uh, as well as the, um, the crayfish as well. And what I thought I would end off, end off with is basically after a day out diving, Danny will talk to you about the whale shark encounters that we embark on after we finish finished diving. There's always a great opportunity to go to the water's edge and have a great relaxing drink where you can meet the sunsets uh, that is presented to you. And we are experiencing them now 
at this time of the year uh, as we as we speak. We just we just missed a great sunset actually today. And I just thought I'd put in a whale shark photo that I captured on <laughs> Saturday, just to give you a flavor before we move over to Danny's presentation. And uh, I thank you very much for your time. And uh, I look forward to answering your questions uh, a little later on. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was a brilliant insight into, uh, into the, the scuba diving in St. Helena. Um, so absolutely fascinating um, in terms of the, um, the actual scuba diving. Um, but as we've mentioned there, one of the main draws is um, the whale sharks themselves. Um, so um, to tell us a little bit about the um, well about whale sharks and specifically uh, of the whale sharks in St Helena, I'm going to hand over to you, Danny, um, if you'd be so kind um, as to um, talk us through a little bit of information on the on, on the whale sharks. Yeah, sure. Thanks, guys. I was also thinking when we were, when, when Nancy was talking about how awesome the uh, the butterfly fish schools were were when we were there because they were there when we were when I was there with the with the with the last group and. Remember, kind of having to literally swim through clouds of them to push them, like, kind of like to get through to know where you're going. It was a remarkable thing. So I really, really hope that happens again when we when we go next uh, when we go next year. Um, alrighty, let's talk about the big guys then. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Obviously, my name is my name is Danny Copeland. Um, I am the chap that would be joining you um, as a sort of the trip leader next year if you come with us to visit St Helena. Um, and so with that in mind, I. I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of give you a bit of a brief, a brief background on you know who on earth I am, um, as well as what I believe is one of the main attractions, one of the main reasons to come to St Helena um, and to come to see it on the water world, and that is obviously the the whale sharks themselves. So a little bit about me. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, I'm a I'm a marine I'm a marine conservationist and a storyteller. And for the last 11 years, I've worked in many different roles in the, the world of marine conservation, underwater media, and the, the crossroads that connect and link the two of them. And as a result, I've, because of the different jobs and roles that kind of I've had within those sectors, I've had to kind of, when, I describe, when describing to people what I do, um, I've given myself the rather pithy, but extraordinarily pretentious title or job, job title of a multimedia specialist for the oceans. Um, the, the main project I'm kind of working on right now, just to, in case you're interested, um, I do an awful lot of work with the Natural History Unit at the BBC, where I'm currently working as an assistant producer rec, uh, director on an underwater film for a big wildlife series that's coming out uh, later this year. And I've been on that project now since the start of the pandemic, um, and I've worked with the NHU in, in other capacities since 2019. Um, but moreover, you know, where did all this start for me? You know, a big part of my career has been squarely focused on a particular selection of marine animals, uh, namely the, the, the ones you see on the screen here, whale sharks, manta rays, and mobula rays, the, the gentle giants of, of the seas. Um, in fact, it's these animals that are where my fascination with the oceans started back when I was still in high school. And you know, even these photos are some of the photos of my first ever encounters with them, so you know, years and years ago. And I'm still absolutely mind blown by these fascinating animals. I, I still find them to be such a, I, I still find it to be amazing that such that such things like these guys, like whales as well, still exist in our oceans today. Um, any of you who've had the fortune of swimming with either of these groups of animals before, you can probably agree with me how much of a life changing experience it is um, and how different they are to each other as well. If you've had the fortune of swimming with both, um, how different they are despite their similar, um, their similar lifestyles. The one is extremely intelligent, arguably the smartest fish in the sea, and the other one is uh, not so much, it's a little bit dippy, um, but also one of the most impressive and enormous things you can see in the ocean. And I can't think of many big animal encounters that you can have on land that come close to swimming with one of these sort of gentle giants. And as a result, I've been fortunate enough to you know, work with these animals throughout much of the last 10 years, these are the slightly more recent photos. You're never too old to take a really awful underwater selfie. Um, <laughs> so I've been very involved uh, both directly in the research of these animals, as well as campaign efforts to use media to help conserve them. And yeah, like I said, I'm still as excited to see these guys in the sea as I was during my first encounters with them um, sort of many years ago. 
good part of that time, I was working for the Manta Trust as well as some of the other NGOs that work with them to work with whale sharks. Because often where you, wherever you see mantas and whale sharks, it's quite often you'll see whale sharks and mantas in the same parts of the world. So I worked with some of the different partners who focus on whale shark research in Maldives, in the Philippines, Tanzania. That's a pretty small world. All the scientists kind of know each other and are kind of, for the most part, all pretty friendly with each other as well. Um, but yeah, in addition to the, to the research and conservation work, I've increasingly worked with media productions to tell stories about these awesome animals, um, including for wildlife history series and feature film productions, as well as projects for the charities themselves. And that's where my time in St. Helena kind of all started, really. Um, one of those projects was for the Blue Marine Foundation, and they helped establish a new marine research team or wing um, within the local NGO, the St. Helena um, National Trust that exists on the island. And one of the main areas of the, of the marine work that they are studying and helping to conserve are the whale sharks that visit St. Helena each year. And that's how I came to visit the island um, back in 2019 and including coming with some, with some guests from Dive Worldwide. Um, I ended up spending six weeks there predominantly on assignment for the Blue Marine Foundation filming their work with the St. Helena Trust and in particular their efforts with the whale sharks. So enough about me. All that kind of brings us to the main question really of, you know, why, why St. Helena? Why come to see these sharks in particular? Now, I mean, of course, there's plenty of reasons to come to St. Helena um, entirely on its own merits. And Anthony and Phil have spent some time going through, you know, all those different amazing aspects of the island. Got really cool dive sites super unique and seldom visited location. The island has a remarkable history, an incredible you know, set of ecosystems and landscapes, and it's just a genuinely really beautiful place with some of the friendliest people that I've ever met in the world. Um, but let's say, let's say for a moment, that none of that interests you and you really are focused squarely on, you want, you want to see some whale sharks. Um, why, you know, why come all this way to come and see them? Because let's be, you know, let's be fair, any of those divers who have been around the block a little bit, there are plenty of places in the world to see whale sharks, and some of them aren't quite as far away as St. Helena. Well, I want to kind of hopefully walk you through sort of main th three main reasons, I think, um, that the sharks here are very much worth coming to see, and if anything, um, my favourite place to see whale sharks in the world. Firstly, the sharks themselves, they, I think, the simplest way I can describe it really is that they are special. Um, they have all the researchers, all the whale shark researchers around the world talking about them and getting really excited. And let me explain why. Um, every hotspot in the world where you see whale sharks, bar the Galapagos, has one thing in common across all of their whale shark populations. Um, we don't really see any major crossover between the whale shark populations, despite the fact that we know these animals can travel a really, really huge, great distance. Now, why, why is that? Well, it's because the sharks you see at these other places in the world, they're all predominantly young males. They're all essentially teenage boys hanging out down the street, hanging out, feeding on, on plankton and stuff. Um, and it means that a lot of the sharks, because they're young teenagers, they're about four to six meters long, which don't get me wrong, that is a really big animal. But it begs the question that the researchers have been asking for years and years, where are all the adults? And well, we're getting slightly closer to the answer and St. Helena is a big part of that. Um, here's some of the stats for the St. Helena population. This is, St. Helena is one of the only known places in the world where adult whale sharks hang out. Um, there's also a really interesting even gender split, whereas all the other places you have a very male biased population, here you have equal parts, you know, for the most part, of male and female. And now, how does that impact you guys? Well, what it means is that these sharks are massive. They are huge. You can see on the screen there, the average length of them is about, you know, seven and a half meters or so, but, and that's only tipped by the Galapagos where the average length is slightly bigger. But even, but even then, in my experience, uh, in the time I spent on St. Helena, like, this average plays down just how big some of the individual sharks can be when you're when you're there. I don't think it's, it's I think it's not uncommon to see some of the seriously big boys and seriously big mamas that are like around eight to ten meters long. And 
it's not just about that sort of length. They are chunky, chunky sharks. They are extremely well fed on the, uh, the food that they're feeding on there. They're, they're, they're so much that they're literally bulging out of their shape. I think I've got a, I think I've got a photo here. Here you go. Absolutely massive. Um, and I can tell you, having seen whale sharks and worked with them in several different countries, there is a massive and almost intimidating difference between swimming with a four to six meter whale shark and an eight to 10 meter leviathan that's the size of, you know, feels like it's the size of a bus. Um, of course, there's also lots of really cool and exciting science going on with them, which I can tell you all about if you come with me on the trip, um, including that St. Helena is frequently coming up as probably the prime spot where scientists will finally be able to see one of the one of the big things that's eluded them for so many so many years, which is whale sharks mating. No one's no one's ever seen whale sharks mating in the wild or in or you know or in captivity. And yet in St. Helena, there are at least two formalized and verified uh, courtship behaviors documented over the last several years. And Anthony was just mentioning before, I saw it on Facebook um, earlier, that they um they had a male shark, you know, sort of circling and chasing a female, exhibiting a lot of behavior that's very, very, um, it's, it, it rings true with what other sharks do during mating behavior and courtship behavior. So that's really, really, really exciting in itself. So that's the sharks. The next thing is that, in my opinion, is that the location itself is special. And I don't mean the island. We've already mentioned that, how awesome that is. I mean the underwater environment that you see them in. Um, this, here's a quick map to kind of give you a bit of a sense of where things are. You know, there's Jamestown, where everything is based and where the dive shop is, Anthony's dive shop is based. And you can see those circles there around some other spots um, along a north, sort of northeastern kind of tip coast of the island, um, where often we see, or the guys see a lot of the sharks. You can technically see them all around the island, um, but this is also due to, the, due to the prevailing winds, the main spots that the researchers and also Anthony and the dive operators um, focus on. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, it's about a 45 minute journey, up, depending on the, sea, on the sea state, from Jamestown to that area on the right, it's the right hand side of the screen there, Barn Cap, um, which is this awesome, really cool underwater plateau, kind of sticks out of the blue, essentially, and um, that you would kind of like swim or hover over. Um, but you can see sharks anywhere between Jamestown and this area. And I mean, crikey, I remember on our trip, we were just talking about it before this call, that <clears throat> we literally on, on, I think, on, on our second or third shark trip as part of our last dive worldwide trip, um, we were less than five minutes out of the harbour. We could still see the, you know, the, the buoys and the things on the, on the, on the side of the, uh, the, side of the harbour. And we stumbled upon this whale shark that was super chill, really, just really not bothered that we were there and it hung out with us for over an hour. That was, that was our whale shark trip because it was just there happily you know, interacting with us. Um, there's something else I guess I'm hoping that some of you might have clocked um, with some of the photos that I'm showing here. Look at that visibility. There's something, I, I mean, it, it is it, it, it's absolutely incredible. The sharks here, I mean, that, that, this is a photo at Barn Cap where that, that, that plateau I mentioned, you can see the shark there, it's about 30 or 40 meters of visibility. And you get this deep, dark sapphire blue in St. Helena that you only really see um, in a few other places in the world, but basically whenever you go somewhere that's in the middle of nowhere, <clears throat> the Azores of the Socorro Islands also kind of spring to mind. Um, that's one of the main reasons why the water is so incredibly clear and blue. But another reason I believe is because of what these guys are feeding on, what the whale sharks are there for. Um, you go elsewhere in the world and a lot, of the, a lot of whale sharks are feeding on blooms of plankton and it often means that the water can be quite green or quite, um, quite milky and, and, and filled with plankton. That's why, the sharks, that's why the sharks are there. But in St. Helena, predominantly the sharks are here feeding on tuna spawn from some of the tuna populations that aggregate around the island and the, and the waters around it. Um, and what I've kind of noticed is that you can barely see these eggs in the water. They're effectively transparent. And yet the whale, it's almost, it almost looks like the whale sharks are just kind of feeding on nothing. Um, and what it ends up meaning is that you have these incredible sort of opportunities, especially any avid photographers out there, where you can, you know, you can see that you can see these enormous animals in some of the clearest, bluest water, um, you know, in the world. And I think 
the sharks themselves, as well as this you know, incredible kind of setting, this unique setting to see them in, kind of basically explains the third point, which is to me, the experience of swimming with, uh, with whale sharks in St. Helena is, is unique amongst all whale shark um, aggregation sites in the world. Um, you know, the location you know, is incredible. The sharks are huge. Um, the sharks are effectively on your doorstep. I, I tend to say to people, you spend an awful lot, you know, you spend an awful lot of effort to get to St. Helena, but when once you're here, the sharks are literally just out, you know, out of the back garden. Um, so the sharks are here, the sharks are huge, the visibility is incredible. Um, the sharks are pretty much on your doorstep within very little travel time to get to them. Um, and it also, crucially, it kind of feels like you have the whale sharks to yourselves. Um, you know, Anthony is one of only a few operators on the island. Um, and it means that that entire area where you can see all these sharks, there might only be a few other boats on the water with other, other folks going to come and see them, um, or the researchers going out to go and see them as well. To me, it feels like there are plenty of sharks to go around and you don't have the, you know, the hordes of boats and the crowds of people piling into the water that sadly, I think, plague a few other places in the world. Um, to me, it means that you get to have the kind of whale shark encounter that I think a lot of us kind of romanticize and dream about when we're thinking about the first time you ever see one of these animals, that you're in the water with this huge leviathan swimming by, minding its own business, and it effectively almost feels like it's just you and them in that, in that moment. Now, some of these photos, by the way, are photos from our trip um, with, the, with the other guests that came with us. Um, it's fair to say that tourism is obviously increasing in St. Helena, and that is a great thing for the island. Um, but fortunately, St. Helena have had the, you know, the kind of the good, the good smarts to already put in a lot of really, really effective um, and well sort of backed tourism interaction rules and laws to manage the tourism sustainably there. So it doesn't sort of evolve into this massive kind of um, craziness that you do some see in other parts of the world. They, you know, they have limits on maximum number of people that can be with a shark or you know, be in the water at specific periods of time to go and see them or distances you have to keep from the animals. But, you know, of course, it's worth mentioning that whale sharks themselves don't always adhere to rules on social distancing. It's pretty common for them to come over um, pretty close to you and sometimes it's almost un it's unavoidable. Um, and then I guess the other thing about seeing the sharks here on St. Helena is that I think there's a very sort of special trait about this island, which is that the people here genuinely and quite deeply care about them and they're really proud of how special their whale sharks are and how much um, how much attention they're getting on the global stage. Um, when I was when I was there we helped set up this this first annual St. Helena Whale Shark Festival which was basically just an excuse for the community to come together and celebrate this awesome animal that is quickly becoming one of their flagship poster childs for tourism to the island. Um, and I believe we we're talking about it before with Anthony that they've kept the festival going despite the pandemic. Hopefully there's another one happening in the next a few weeks or months or so and I'm quietly hopeful that maybe the next one might be arranged at the same time that the trip is running that our trip is running next year so I mean that's enough for me I hope that kind of gives you guys a little bit of a taster of who I am why you should come and see the whale sharks in St Helena uh, like these guys did back in 2019 and I'm you know really excited to see some of you hopefully join me in going halfway around the world to swim with one of the ocean's most charismatic animals in what I consider to be the single best place in the world to swim with. Thank you very much. Danny, that was absolutely inspiring. Thank you very much and uh, really fascinating insight into uh, those whale sharks and um, just why they are so special. Um, so we've got a few questions coming in. Um, I hope everybody else found that uh, as fascinating as I did. Um, just before um, I go to the questions, um, our marketing team um, have done a little poll for me. So I have to release a, I need to release a poll for you, um, which asks you a little question. Um, before I do that, um, I think I have to give you a little bit more information though. Um, so just to give you a little bit more detail on the trip we're talking about here, just a quick summary. Um, so if I can get my screen in order, here we go. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so um, this particular trip that we're running with Danny um, is planned for um, mid-Feb 2023. Um, 
from the UK, um, we're looking at 12 days for the trip and 3995 per person. Um, that includes your flights uh, from the UK. Um, I saw a question mentioning about the airlines that fly there, so I'll cover that in a moment. Um, uh, you need two nights in South Africa, pre and post um, your trip to St. Helena, seven nights at the Mantis Hotel, breakfast, some of the evening meals. Um, some of them we leave free um, because Anthony's got some, some recommendations up his sleeve. <laughs> um, 10 boat dives, um, three whale shark snorkeling excursions because you can only snorkeling with the uh, whale sharks, um, but that's the superior experience because of the nature of it. Um, we talked very briefly about some of the things you can do on on land with the the distillery and so on and so forth um so there's a couple of land tours in there as well um all your tra transfers and of course uh, the services of danny and all his expert insight um so that gives you a quick summary of the trip um that we're talking about here and that we'd love you to join us on um i'm going to have a uh, an attempt at launching the poll here so hopefully um, you've got a little poll there that's on your screen, if I've done that right. Um, and if you answer yes, it will make our marketing team very happy. Um, while you're looking at that, um, I let's turn our attention to the questions that we've got coming in. And please do feel free to um, write your questions on the, the Q&A um, and we will um, answer them all if we possibly can. Um, so um, first question from Jane Baxter, actually on the chat. Hello, Jane. Um, Jane asks, is this trip suitable for snorkelers? Um, I don't dive. Um, and what is the swimming like? Um, so as we mentioned there, the whale shark encounters, Jane, are the main attraction. Um, so they are snorkeling encounters anyway. So I'd say absolutely the trip is um, suitable for snorkelers. Um, Anthony, um, in terms of the um, the boat trips, um, are there some of the sites that we will go to that are, are suitable for snorkelers as well? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. Most of That's the site right. is, is suitable for snorkelers. Uh, so it's basically along the coastline um, where snorkelers can join the dive groups if they choose. Uh, if, there's, if they're wishing to do any land tours or adventure hikes, there's loads to do on land as well, on the island itself. So they will have an option of snorkeling or going on adventure walks obviously i'm sure they would want to uh, engage with the snorkeling activities of the whale sharks uh, as, as part of the program excellent excellent um and um jane there's lots of other things that you can do on land as well um there um <laughs> the the tours we mentioned and um, you've got the distillery uh, you've got the plantation house um you, depending on how adventurous you are it's a lovely destination for walking or uh, uh kayaking mountain biking um lovely night skies so there's there, there's plenty for for non-divers there um we've got a question as well from from uh mark silverstone which is which international airlines fly to st helena um so um, the route we'll be taking um, and the routes that's getting sort of established again now post pandemic um, is to fly into Johannesburg. There's a few airlines that fly into Johannesburg um, and then it's Airlink, um, one of the South African airlines um, that offer the schedules out to St. Helena. So that's the uh, uh, generally the simplest way to get there from the UK. Um, and that's all part of the trip that we will arrange for you, of course. Um, then we've got Sally and Nick Charter. Uh, they've asked, what's the water temperature for February? Uh, Sally and Nick, I know you dive in the UK quite often, so it'll be plenty warm enough for you. Um, but <laughs> Anthony, can you, <laughs> uh, can you give us uh, an insight into um, water temperatures at the time of the trip? So the average water temperature will be about 25 degrees during the month of February until about end of March, April where it just goes down to about 24. So at the moment, we're diving in 25 degrees Celsius. Perfect. OK, very nice. Um, Pat would like to know um, typical dive depth. Um, also, just sort of uh, you asked about the temperature as well. So we covered that um, and a typical dive dive day, how the how the general schedule works. So a typical dive day, we, we generally would like to uh, leave the landing area around about 8.30, not 8.45. And then we will have a 10 to 15 minute boat ride to the first dive site. We embark on our first dive, which probably would last around about 50, to, 50 minutes to an hour. And then we will have a 45 minute to an hour break on the boat. And then we 
go in, embark for our second dive, which again will be about 45 minutes to an hour. We, the idea is that we um, conduct the two dives, two tank morning dive, and then we come back to the dive shop and we, uh, everyone can head off for their lunch. And then the afternoon, uh, if, it's, it, it, if it's part of the program, we we'll embark on our whale shark snorkel trip uh, in the afternoon around about 1.30 to 2 p.m. Perfect, perfect. Um, and Kit, hi there, Kit, um, was asking, um, where are the dive sites relative to the harbour? Are they all around the island or on the north coast? And sort of what are their general uh, boat journeys and, and typical currents he's interested in? So the dive sites, as per Danny's uh, image earlier, or the map that he, he kindly provided, it's, it's on the side of Jamestown, so which is the leeward side of the island. So it's well protected. Uh, so there's very little, or if there's any current, it's going to be mild. The typical depth would be around about, for the first dive, it ranges because it's a sloping bottom. So you could go down to about 24 to 25 meters, even 30 meters if you choose to. But you could maintain an average depth of about 18 meters uh, if, you, if you choose as well. And then um, the sites, if there's an opportunity, we will head around to the northeast side of the island if there's an opportunity to do so. Uh, one of my favorite sites is on that particular side where we have uh, encounters of the mobulus uh, on a regular basis. So um, I generally would like to include that as part of the program. But it's typically on the northeast and the northern side of the island, which is the leeward side. Perfect. Um, Jeff asked, I'm not actually sure of the answer to this, so I have to pass this over to you, Anthony, as well. Um, is right. um, St. Helena, um, is there any um, possibility for technical or rebreather diving in St. Helena? Unfortunately, uh, none, none of them. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it will be, but uh, I'm, and at this moment, we haven't had any technical re or rebreather diving uh, uh, occurring here in St. Helena. We the facilities are very limited at this time. Uh, it's due to the nature of transporting as well as our limited facilities that we do have on Ireland. At the moment, it is uh, pure, uh, just breathing air that we dive off. Super, excellent. Um, and then um, Sally and Nick ask if there's opportunity to add additional dives, I guess, um, on this particular trip. Um, because we're going for two boat dives and then um, certainly on the days we're whale shark diving or you're going out in the afternoon with the whale sharks, then I guess it's not really the kind of destination where it's possible to do four or five dives a, a day. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, yeah. uh, unless if the, if the days in which uh, there is no, nothing on the program uh, in terms of our whale shark trip, then that day, if, if anyone chooses to go on a third dive, uh, that it can be arranged. Super. OK. Um, and then uh, bear with me. Let me just scroll through the questions, make sure I don't miss any. I think we've answered a few of those. Um, Caroline asks, um, can people join the trip there rather than book the, the complete trip? Um, so I'll um, answer that for you, Caroline. So um, um, if you wish to, um, then you are welcome to book um, uh, or arrange your own flights, if you like. Um, I think we would probably recommend that we look after things from Johannesburg, um, but it's entirely up to you. Um, we also have some people already booked on the trip that are extending um, for um, additional time in St. Helena. Um, so the flights, um, when we get back to normal schedules, um, are usually once a week. Um, so it's either one week or two weeks, um, but there's opportunities there to, to extend there and do what you want and arrange your own flights if you want to. Um, Bjorn is asking, hi there, Bjorn, um, if Nitrox is available for the divers. Uh, unfortunately, not at this time. I, I am definitely working on it, but it's, it's uh, something that the island is, would like to move forward holistically with. Um, I have to mention is that we don't have a recompression chamber here either at this moment in time. So we, we generally would like to encourage, uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's, just the ear that uh, the pure ear that we have but um we, we have to go with the government and and uh, abide by somewhat uh, a manageable situation that we have in terms of our diving uh, limitations at this time in terms of medical facilities etc 
Um, super, thank you very much. Um, so we've got a few more questions on the chat. Um, so I'll just go over there. Um, Danny, um, over, to you, <laughs> over to you first. Um, uh, are you still eating custard cream? Says Lynn, who is in the pink, ra pink rash vest on that photo <laughs> you took in 2019, which he was on the trip with you there. Hi, Lynn and Simon. Yeah, I remember that. I remember. Of course, I've never stopped eating custard creams, but I, did, I have evolved my palate a bit further. Yeah. I now I have the occasional hobnob and possibly a bourbon as well. Good choices. All, all excellent biscuits, in, in my opinion. <laughs> um, Serena would like to know if there's a maximum number of people on the trip. Um, yes, there is, Serena. Um, so we've already got a few people booked up. And um, what we don't want to do is, um, you know, we want this to be a personal I experience. Um, so um, we're limiting numbers. Um, I believe it's 14 people um, that this trip's limited to. Um, but if we reach full numbers there, um, then we've got a second week on hold as well with Anthony. Um, so if we've got enough numbers, we can run a, a second trip. But we're intending that it's quite an intimate trip. Um, it is a group trip, but um, we don't want it to be sort of, you know, a coach load of people. I think it's very important for the quality of the trip that it's a, you know, it's, it's a small group. So that's what we're aiming for. Um, uh, so we've also got uh, Nikki Harold. Hello, Nikki. Um, asking if we'd welcome, if we'd consider putting on a two centre package with diving in Mozambique. Um, so that's definitely something we can tailor make. Um, uh, I don't know if Danny would be able to join you in, in Mozambique, but we could do, um, I mean, they work quite well. You use the South Africa as the base for both. Um, so you could go over to TOFO or head to Northern Mozambique um, and do um, a tailor made trip and we could arrange that for you. No problem at all. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Mark says, thanks very much, I'm sold. Um, what dive kit is available or do we need to um, bring our own? Um, so um, we would assume it's sort of in the cost of the trip, it doesn't include equipment rental, um, but I, I assume, Anthony, if people need to rent something, you've got a limited supply of kit there to, um, to assist. Uh, yes, that's correct, Paul. We, we do have a selection of kit. Uh, it's all Scuba Pro. Uh, so it's it, from the wetsuits all the way through to the dive computers, regulators, BCDs, everything. Yeah. So we, we have a selection of kit that uh, individuals can choose if they if they would like. Um, OK. Um, and Nikki also asked, um, is there a wind chill factor to consider in surface intervals? So, um, uh, you know, Red Sea, for example, there's you know, it can get chilly between between dives if it's not in the, 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 the warmest months. Um, is that a factor for for St. Helena? At the moment, it's the sunblock factor. So <laughs> I would recommend plenty of sunblock. Uh, Excellent. Because, because it's, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming at, at times, even for myself. Yeah, uh, okay. During the surface interval. Definitely a good tip for, for, for me as one of the world's ginger people. Um, Pat wants to know if there, uh, the second trip, um, Pat, um, that would be, I think we've actually got the week before held um, if we fill up this one. Um, but as I say, we'll only move on to that second week if we um, um, if this one gets full. Um, uh, somebody called HP um, asks, can you come alone and pay a single supplement? Yes, you can. Um, and if you request a travel plan on the poll, um, then um, Sue from our marketing team, she will send you a full itinerary um, and it details in there what the single supplement is. I believe it's £450, so it's not too expensive at all. Um, and last question, I think from Serena, um, where is the nearest recompression chamber? Um, so I know there's um, plans to bring one um, to the island, um, but I, I believe I'm right in saying, is it over in, over in South Africa, Anthony? That's correct, yes. It's over in yeah. South Africa. So yeah, uh, yeah. the nearest yeah. facility would be South Africa. Yeah. So it's important, you know, I mean, it's always important not to be irresponsible on your dives, um, but it is a very, very remote location. So, you know, you have to be conservative on your deco limits and, and so on and so forth when you're when you're diving there. Um, right. OK, our time is up. Um, I think I've answered all the questions. Um, I hope for everybody that that was uh, uh, a fascinating um a uh, fascinating presentation and we'd absolutely love you to join us on the trip um, so please do um, get in touch if you're interested um, and um, yeah we we hope to see you soon and we hope you enjoyed that and have a lovely evening um, thank you to Danny and um, thank you for Anthony to your time I'm glad our internet um, managed to make it through the evening there um, and we'll see you uh, see you next time all right thank you thanks all. everybody thanks very much you guys thank you very much Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.